Hi, welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a stroke survivor and grateful recovering alcoholic. And uh, yesterday I was talking a little bit about brain fog in my baking episode. So I wanted to spend some time today looking up uh, what brain fog in, what the, what brain fog is and what causes brain fog and what's happening in the brain when you have brain fog and all of that stuff. So um, let's see how this goes. I actually came across an interesting, um, I don't know, conclusion. You know how I've been relating my uh, sobriety a recovery to my stroke recovery? Well, amazingly enough, there is brain fog, of course, that is associated with uh, somebody who is a recovering alcoholic. So I dug out some of my paperwork from my IOP class, and there it is. I found uh, information about um, what's called post-acute withdrawal symptoms, when you're recovering from alcoholism, and some of the major symptoms are brain fog, thought disorders, memory disorders, and so on and so forth. So I'll get into that, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about what I found out um, just doing some searching online about brain fog as it relates to folks that have had a stroke. So Um, First of all, I didn't even know yesterday, like, if what I was experiencing, like, I experienced a lot of brain fog yesterday and throughout today um, because I just uh, was fatigued from um, having a guest over and, and having some activities, lovely activities, but activities still the same that kind of exhausts me so I was looking up what this brain fog thing is brain fog is often categorized as uh, confusion forgetfulness and lack of mental clarity so what are some things that cause brain fog and I ran across that chronic pain can cause brain fog. And guess what? I have chronic pain. So um, brain fog is a general term that's used for symptoms that are caused from lots of different illnesses. Lots. I mean, from cancer to stroke to uh, alcoholism, withdrawal, and um, all of this stuff. So brain fog is a general term. And I'll get more into uh, the specifics about um, what they know and what they don't know about brain fog. So uh, brain fog is often um, related to fatigue, physical and mental fatigue. It causes cognitive problems, communication problems, um, can induce emotional changes and create low mood um, is what they called it. And I definitely would categorize my mood often these days as low. (laughs) But uh, also brain fog can be a side effect effect from medication as well. So Um, When managing post-stroke fatigue, you will often run across brain fog. And uh, I listened to a couple articles about individuals who shared their experience um, after their stroke with regard to brain fog. And so there was one lady who said that she cannot listen to people talk and cook at the same time. And I thought, 
that is exactly what was happening yesterday when I tried to put put the uh, measuring cup on top of the baking soda container as a lid. Um, so my boyfriend and my niece were talking and I was very much engaged in the conversation. You know, I was active listening and yet trying to do these physical activities. Um, I wasn't measuring anything, but I was moving things around and taking things out and cleaning things up. And so um, this individual shared that she also has a hard time doing uh, these, what would seem like two simple activities. So uh, this was interesting. So the studies that they have done have one in particular that I was listening to is a study that was done. It was funded by Johns Hopkins and also included the University of Maryland. And they were trying to figure out what causes brain fog what's happening in your brain during brain fog and they compared people who had a stroke um, at different periods of time after the stroke and how uh, if they could actually see something happening in the brain while they were showing signs of brain fog so this was, they, you know, they, they had a, a, oh, I can't think of the word. They had a, you know, two, gr- a control group. There it is. <laughs> they had a control group and then they had a group of people who had minor strokes and um, they chose people that um, fell under certain um, characteristics about their stroke, but it didn't matter where the dead tissue was in their brain. It, it, uh, what they concluded was no matter how small the dead tissue lesion and no matter where it was in the brain, you need your entire brain to think clearly and function globally is what they called it. And so no matter where the lesions were, it affected that, that general cognitive behavior, that ability to think clearly as a whole. Um, so these people did not have... Like when they tested for uh, aphasia and and different types of obvious cognitive uh, impairments from the stroke, they they cleared all of those. This was more of a generalized ability to focus and pay attention and think clearly. So. Um, what they found was that the, the individuals who had the stroke, their signals were subdued is how they worded it. Yesterday I worded it, uh, I had heard somewhere, it felt feels like your brain is firing through marshmallow fluff. That's, that's, how, that's a great uh, description of what it feels like. And these medical people say your signals are subdued. So it's about the same thing. Um, so your neur- you have neural sluggishness. Um, your processing is less efficient after the stroke, no matter where the lesion is. So this brain fog cannot be diagnosed. It's something that... Um, People have been talking about for years after they have a stroke, after they, um, you know, throughout cancer recovery, lots of different um, 
situations that illnesses that cause a lot of stress on and fatigue on the body um, if they get a cat scan or an mri they can't see anything uh, blatantly like going on inside the brain so but it does cause uh, your neural processing to be to be impacted one small lesion can make a global impact and they say it disrupts the neural network as a whole the neural community um, how the brain talks to itself so I've done lots of episodes on these connections between our brain cells and that's what I'm imagining in my head is that it's impacting those connections um, so what they call it at least in this paper is post a stroke sorry post stroke acute dissecutive syndrome p s a d e s and um, it causes multitasking problems and um, and so then it went into i listened to a lot of words that i don't understand so it was talking about neuro neuroimaging meg scam, scanner and this is where they put these magnetic sensors on the person's brain like they measure they measure the size of the brain and the shape of the head and then they put these magnetic sensors on and then they have the person do things like a uh, word and picture matching they'll like give you time to get familiar with the words and the and the pictures and then the and then the test begins and they run all of them by you and you have to uh mat decide if the word they'll show a picture and they'll show a word and you have to decide as quickly as possible if the word matches the image and i would imagine um, just from my experience so far where I'm, um, I'll sometimes choose a word that I can almost, I can almost tell how my brain is categorizing words by how I replace words. Um, for example, the best example I have is, uh, that it was, I was talking about cleaning a window and I said cleaning the mirror and I thought that I, it made me kind of stop in my tracks because I thought huh that's pretty cool like I my brain categorized these two soft like materials they're soft and they are similarly like reflective you know and so my brain categorized the words together I don't know I was fascinated when it happened to me so now when I replace a word uh with the wrong word I think about huh <laughs> how my brain over the years has categorized words I don't know I mean you know I try to find fun where I can <laughs> so I'm paying attention to how my brain is categorizing things um anywho so all of this is, it was super interesting to me uh let's see if I've missed anything um the people that they were testing were anywhere from the age of 18 years old to 70 years old and um and yeah so what did they conclude that well, it's what you would guess that the people who had the stroke um, were slower at at working through those image mat matching activities. And there were a lot of other activities that they talked about. Um, so <laughs> in conclusion, at the very end of the paper, it's like 20 pages long or something. And I'm listening to the whole thing. So you can imagine. Uh, it was super exciting. And I got to the results section. And it's like, uh, 
yeah, so the stroke people were slower and we don't have any idea what's going on in there <laughs> with the white matter. I think they call it white matter. So, yeah, I mean, super exciting there that, you know, it seems like par for the course for me is that, yeah, we're doing all this research and stuff and we have no idea what's wrong with you. So I thought, well, I remember hearing that people recovering from alcoholism experience brain fog. So like I said, I pulled out my handy folder from my IOP and I found, sure enough, this uh, paper on post-acute withdrawal symptoms. So it's, a, it's symptoms that occur as a result of abstaining from alcohol and drugs. The, drugs. These are sobriety-based symptoms and they can come from a lot of different things, a lot of different, uh, they, there's lots of causes for them. So they can be caused by damage to uh, your neural connections, your brain cells, and, um, and that can be caused by the toxic effects of alcohol. But what also causes brain fog as, as it relates to alcoholism is dehydration. That will cause brain fog. Also, um, stress. So dealing with life without alcohol in the beginning is both an emotional and physical stress. That's just off the charts. Take it from me. And so um, that level of stress can cause brain fog. You know what I was thinking of just now? Um, hot off the press. I was thinking, you know when you're working and you have so many things on your plate that you feel overwhelmed all of a sudden and you're almost, um, you're almost just, Ugh, I can't think of the word, uh, immobile. You know, you, you can't do anything because there's so much that you have to do. It's almost hard to concentrate when you start fe getting overwhelmed with too many things and too much stress. And that has to be related, wouldn't you think? It seems like it would be related to me um, because I can get so, uh, like if I am asked to do public speaking back when I really had overwhelming anxiety from, from, uh, public speaking, this is when I was still drinking, I would have the brain fog for sure. Like I couldn't remember what I was supposed to say and stuff. And it was just terrifying, just terrifying, um, and what I learned, side note, is practice, practice, practice. And then uh, you will eliminate a lot of that stress and brain fog. Back to the regularly scheduled program. So the main causes of brain fog are stress and neurological damage when it comes to alcoholism, but also can be caused from dehydration. So... The severity really depends on the severity of the, uh, the neurological damage and stress from the recovery. So the majority of it is reversible and 75 to 95% of people recovering from alcoholism will experience some uh, degree of brain fog. And this is a dangerous part when you're trying to recover from alcoholism because that brain fog is a major cause of somebody relapsing. So it's a normal part of recovery and it can be treated and, and managed with, with just some, some easy recommendations. And I have those for you 
after we go through some of this. Uh, but when an individual is, is taking the alcohol away from them and their, and their brain cells are actually telling them they need the alcohol to survive, that brain fog, you know, just adds to the problem. And that individual often thinks that in order to survive, in order to heal or get better, they need alcohol. Um, so it's, it's a major cause of relapse. So here are some six major symptoms of brain fog. So the first one is thought disorders. And again, same thing as the stroke brain fog. It can't be diagnosed. This is just something that um, I guess over the years people just report uh, the symptoms and they don't know yet. They can't see it happening in the brain. Well, these John Ho Johns Hopkins people could. They can see something happening, they said, in the magnetic sensors. Okay. Thought disorders, the inability to think clearly, um, your intelligence is not affected, the brain uh, sometimes works fine and sometimes it doesn't, but you really can't concentrate for more than just a few minutes. And uh, your thoughts, that feeling of your thoughts going around and around, you're unable to uh, break through a circular pattern in your thoughts or organizing your thoughts. I call that a thought loop. And I was doing it earlier today, actually. Uh, I just kept, I don't know, it, it's like I was, it's like I was purposely putting myself into this stressful thought loop. Um, I know that's not unusual for me. But um, lately, I really am trying to check myself and get myself out of it. And so what I would do was focus on my puppy's breathing because we were napping. And I was just kind of laying there and kept almost getting stressed out. And my I could feel like my temperature was going up. I was getting hot and everything because I was getting stressed out. So I tried to just focus on my dog's breathing. And, um, and it calmed me back down. I don't mind listening to their breathing. breathing. I've talked to you about how I don't like to focus on my own breathing because it makes me feel like I can't breathe. <laughs> um, so thought disorders, it also may feel like your mind is racing. Um, you have difficulty thinking abstractly about things like love or commitment or um, being creative. So the second major symptom of brain fog is a memory disorder. So uh, short-term memory, you may forget something within 20 minutes or so after you learn it. And uh, long-term memory, you may not remember significant events. Um, that very much happened to me while I was drinking and when I first was recovering. But over the past seven years, I have gotten my memory back like it's no one's business. Like I, it's like a steel trap in there <laughs> now. So trust me, it does get better. Um, at least it did for me. So um, yeah, so what I used to do when I was drinking was like, or when I first came out of recovery too, was that I knew what I was trying to remember was in there, you know, like it was inside that brain of mine somewhere. I just couldn't, I couldn't pull it out. And now I get that feeling like, oh, it's in there. Hold on, hold on. And it's almost like I just I don't know. I can pull things out that I never used to do before. It's it's quite interesting. You know, it's almost as exciting as when I got sober and I started sweating for the first time because I was always so dehydrated. It's so fun when you your body starts doing things it's supposed to. 
<laughs> okay, so number three, uh, affective disorders. This means overreaction or you get angry over small things. And um, it's, it's correlated to mood string. Sorry, mm, my words today. Mood swings, your moods will go back and forth. Emotional numbness, your emotions may shut down. You're unable to feel anything. And um, I've felt that before too, for sure. So uh, when you're overreacting, you put even more stress on the nervous system. And then sometimes that will turn into emotional numbness, almost like, I guess, kind of like what I was talking about, where uh, I don't know. I keep thinking of when you're working and you just get all this stuff piled on you and it's so much stress that all of a sudden you're just like numb to it, you know? Um, number four is sleep disorders. So you may have unusual or disturbing dreams. Um, they will decrease and become less intense the longer that you're abstinent. This often is called to us folks in sobriety, drinking dreams. And uh, I have had drinking dreams for the past seven years. I still have them. But um, in the beginning, it was very disturbing because you wake up and you're like, did I drink? Did I drink? And then, oh, it was just a dream. Um, today, it's almost a little more humorous to me. Um, when I have a drinking dream, I wake up and I'm like, yeah, I partied in my dream again, you know, because, well, again, I'm always trying to look at something, uh, humorous about it. And, and yeah, so I party in my dreams. So, uh, for the longest time I didn't, I would have a drinking dream, but I didn't actually drink. It was like there was something always keeping me away from drinking or I was like looking for alcohol and I couldn't find it. But later on in sobriety, like over the past couple years, I actually have drank in my dream because I know I'm dreaming, which is weird. Um, okay, so sleeping disorders, difficulty sleeping, um, a change in the day, uh, the time of day that you sleep, or there's uh, the potential for marathon sleeping. You sleep longer periods of time than usual, and I feel like that's what's happening with me right now. I'm marathon sleeping, but I think I'm supposed to. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, people. So number five psychomotor disorders. This is dizziness, trouble with hand-eye coordination, trouble with balance, and slow reflexes. I feel like I can relate to that as well. And then finally, the sixth one is sensitivity to stress. There is a direct relationship between stress and brain fog. And each one intensifies the other. It's a vicious cycle. So uh, this says difficulty distinguishing between high and low stress. You may not notice low stress as it's building. And then all of a sudden, bam, you are like fully stressed out and you snap. Um, and that's kind of that affective disorder where you've got that overreaction. Um, you may feel stressed and overreact to situations that don't typically bother you. And it's really just because um, you're overwhelmed, you know, you like for me, I'm just overwhelmed. Even reading this piece of paper is over freaking whelming to me. And, and I think that's why I keep tripping on my words and stuff because I'm, I'm trying to calm down, but I can't really calm down. 
Um, in high stress, your brain may just shut down and result in confusion, memory problems, or inappropriate emotions. So this is all, wow, this just hits home for me today. I'm glad I found this information. So we're going to move on. So what can I do about it? What can we do about this brain fog that I feel like people experience brain fog in any situation? You know, when you when you lose somebody you love, there's definitely brain fog. It's just overwhelming stress and emotion and you just can't you know, you can't figure out up from down, you know. Um, so what can we do about it? Uh, well, I think the first thing we need to do is identify the source of stress. And I'm very familiar with what source of stress I'm having right now. And um, it's just all of this uh, head pain. I, I think that's really what's causing the issue for me. Um, the more stimulation and activity I have, the more brain fog I have, the more head pain I have. So it's all very, uh, it seems like it grows simultaneously um, in parallel. So uh, the next thing that we can do to start managing this brain fog is to practice decision making and problem solving skills. So I did the episode yesterday on baking. I think that these types of activities, baking, sewing, um, you know, the sewing thing, what I'm doing is I'm taking these um, clothes that we would be donating and I'm uh, cutting them into pieces and I'm making landscapes out of them. And this is a problem solving activity. Like I'm looking at a picture and matching the picture using different textiles and colors and stuff uh, with the clothes. So that seems like it would really fall under this develop skills and decision making and problem solving. So I will continue to think of different activities that fall under that and probably jot some notes down. Um, the next is our diet. So always what you put in um, in your body, we are what we eat, right? Uh, exercise. I have started walking the dogs over to the school to let them run around. I just do not feel well enough to take them for a walk through the neighborhood. I just don't. So um, at least I'm continuing to check myself and be honest with myself. Um, I keep feeling like you should be able to do this by now. That's what I'm telling myself. And that's why I want to keep trying. But um, I just can't. Like it's it's difficult enough for me to walk my Weimaraner over to the school all the way across the field to the baseball field. Um, so I'm just going to keep doing that. And I'd really like to do my yoga. But What's happening is I take my afternoon nap and then yoga is on my schedule after that. And that is the last thing I want to do after, when I'm groggy after a nap is exercise. So I think I'm going to rearrange my world famous schedule tomorrow because there's a few things that I think aren't um, aren't ordered very well. Like after my sobriety meeting in the morning, it's a little difficult for me to dive right into doing um, podcast research because my brain is already tired from taking my notes 
during my AA meeting. So I'm going to rearrange some things. You know why? Because I can. And the next thing I can do is relaxation. So naming what the stress is that I'm feeling. Always name it. What's the feeling? Name it. And then practice some relaxation techniques, you know, light a candle, um, meditate, and do some stretching. I do like to stretch. Sit out on the back deck. Uh, I have a hummingbird feeder out on my back deck, and the hummingbirds are not shy. They just come over, and they're like a foot away from my face, and they just come over and and drink their hummingbird nectar. So that tends to be very relaxing for me also. Um, next is building regular habits and structure, which of course I have with my world famous schedule and a positive attitude. And well, I always have a positive attitude, except for when I'm crying. <laughs> It's either I have a positive attitude or I'm breaking down. So um, next is grounding. And I did a whole episode on grounding. So I can listen back to that episode. And um, yeah, that's it. Those are the, the different ways that we can manage our brain fog. So I'm going to dive right in and start managing my brain brain fog through uh, doing the things that I'm already doing. I mean, these are all the things that I'm already doing, right? I'm doing some hobbies that don't hurt my head, like sewing, and I'm going to start trying to do a little more baking. I'm eating, trying to eat right, except for my Coca-Colas. I drink too many of those. Uh, Exercise, do some relaxation, have structure, positive attitude, and practice grounding techniques. So I think this was uh, a very successful podcast, podcast indeed. So thanks for listening. Share it with a friend, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.